would have loved being here with our wonderful speaker, Rabbi Sharon Browse. Her words of Torah, the importance of community, connection, and showing up for one another would have surely moved Sherman to tears. And those words are echoed in the way he lived. Rabbi Brous is the founding and senior rabbi of Ikar, a trailblazing Jewish community based in Los Angeles. She has been named the number one most influential rabbi in the US by Newsweek and the Daily Beast. And she's been selected to bless two presidents, both President Obama and President Biden at their national inaugural prayer services. And her TED Talk, Reclaiming Religion, has been viewed by an incredible, has been viewed an incredible one and a half million times. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. A New Yorker by heart, which to me is a sign of a great person. She's grown deeply enamored of the sunshine and the promise in Los Angeles, where she lives with her husband and her children. Please help me welcome Rabbi Sharon Browse. All right. Hi, everyone. Good evening. This is going to be a physical challenge for me because I like to move around when I talk, but hi folks on Zoom. It's good that you're with us and I'm going to try to stay here as much as I can, but sometimes you just can't contain the spirit and you have to move a little bit. So we'll see how it goes. Um, thank you, Mike, for that beautiful intro and Andy, thank you. Um, I think this is such a wonderful thing to do in memory of your husband and your father and your father-in-law. And so I'm so grateful to the whole family and thank you for sharing a bit about Sherman. Um, for folks like me who didn't know him, I feel like I had a little bit of a sense of who he was in the world. Um, and I'm so grateful to Rabbi Linder and Rabbi Andy Green, who's here, who met his wife at Simchat Torah at Ikar in Los Angeles, which is amazing. Um, and although I don't see you now, you're, oh, there you are. Um, and of course, to the incredible people at, uh, at Valley Beit Midrash. And so I want to just take a moment um, and thank Eddie and Isaac and the whole team. By the way, Eddie got a major bat mitzvah de Bartara shout out at Ikar. Um, your wisdom is uh, sounding for, uh, from the coasts. And so it's great to know that the impact of your work here um, in, in Scottsdale is actually reverberating. And of course, to my friend and teacher and colleague, Rabbi Shmuley Yanklowitz, I am so proud to know you um, and just awed and inspired by the way that you walk in the world and by this beautiful community that you have built. And I hope that you and your family feel deeply loved and held um, by this community and you're such a blessing. So thank you. Um, all right. Hi, folks. Uh, we're here tonight because I wrote a book. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Amen Effect, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts and World. But I'm actually going to start with a story that happened just two days ago. So a beloved educator in my community, um, not the daughter-in-law of Anita, uh, who is here, who's another beloved educator in our community, um, Rebecca Berger, the brilliant uh, Rebecca Berger, but but a beloved educator named Beth um, was at the pottery studio where she goes whenever she has free hours. And she was talking with a friend and a man she didn't know was at the wheel across from her. And she and her friend were talking and she mentioned something about, well, at shul, we do it this way. And he said, oh, you're Jewish? And she said, yes. And he said, so am I. And so she said, phew, because in these days, you never know how that conversation is going to end. And so they started to talk. Uh, Tell me a little bit about your family. She mentioned her kids. She asked, do you have any kids? He said, well, he said, my son is 32. Um, my daughter's 26 and my other daughter was 28. And then he got up and excused himself and went to go get more clay and and deal with the um and deal with something in the other part of the studio. And Beth said that she's been listening to my audiobook. Um and she thought, you know, I could let the moment pass, or I could actually do what I'm being asked to do by my rabbi 
And so for the first time in human history, someone did what their rabbi wanted them to do in the right moment at the right time. Okay. So she walked over to this man and she said, um, I, she said, I noticed when you told me about your children that you said your daughter was 28. It sounds like you lost a child. Is it okay if I ask, did you have a tragedy in your family? And he answered and he said, yes, my daughter died and it's been two years. And she said, would you like to talk about it? And he said, yes, thank you. And he started to cry and they sat down and they talked about his daughter. And then she asked if she could see a picture of him. And he showed her a picture that was taken when the two of them uh, on the morning of her death went on a bike ride together. And even though her life was encased in darkness, that morning she had pure joy and knew how deeply she was loved. And what he explained to her was that because of the nature of her death, many of his friends have pulled away from him and haven't asked him about her and haven't asked him about the grieving process and haven't checked in and haven't asked, can I look at the pictures with you? Can you tell me stories? How are you holding your grief? But then Beth, a stranger in a studio, did. And she uh, very excitedly called to tell me afterwards. And she said, Sharon, this is the amen effect. And I realized she was exactly right. And she said, the thing is, it didn't just make him feel better. He said, he thanked her and said, this was very moving for him. She said, it felt like it was a gift for me because I felt like I was doing something that was actually helping a brokenhearted person in real time. So Amen to that. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this idea. The idea of the Amen effect actually originates from a Mishnah. Mishnah, um, for those who aren't familiar, is the ancient Jewish compendium of law codified around the year 220 CE. So very, very old text. And I came across a particular Mishnah when I was in seminary in New York a long time ago. And I remember sitting in my uh, my cramped New York apartment, looking over this text. It's a pretty terse, maybe three line text in the version I had. And I was staring at it and I could not crack the code on this text. And I had the wherewithal to realize that something incredibly powerful and meaningful was happening on the page before me. But honestly, I think I just hadn't experienced enough life yet to understand it. So I went over to my photocopier and I photocopied the page, folded it up and stuck it back in my Mishnah and back on my shelf. We moved out to Los Angeles a couple of years later. We started a community. I had a few babies. I married um, many couples. I helped many couples through divorce and I buried a number of people. And then one day I pulled this Mishnah off the shelf about 10 years later, and this piece of paper came fluttering out and I took it in my hands and read it again. And this time I thought, my God, I think this is actually the essence of life. This three line obscure Mishnah from Midot, which is not, it's not on the, the top 10 list. Maybe now it will be after my, after my book. Um, I hope, I hope it's on, on someone's greatest hits list. It's certainly on mine. So here's what the Mishnah says. It talks about the ancient pilgrimage ritual. When Jews would come from all across the land and the diaspora, they would ascend to Jerusalem, a city on a hill. They would climb the steps to the Temple Mount they would enter through a grand arched entryway. Some of you have walked through similar arched entryways in Jerusalem's old city. And they would turn en masse hundreds of thousands of people at a time. Forgive me, Zoom people. They would turn and walk around the perimeter of the courtyard of the Temple Mount. Imagine all of these people from wherever they came from, sinking up hundreds of thousands of people at a time and moving en masse in a circle, circling around the courtyard and essentially exiting precisely where they had entered. When I envision what this ritual must have felt like, I imagine Mecca and the Hajj because we all have a mental image of what the Hajj looks like. We've probably seen pictures from the Hajj. And as unimaginable as pilgrimage, was back then, I can I I bet it felt something like this. 
And actually researching the book, I read a lot of testimonies of pilgrims who went, who, who went to the Hajj to try to understand what it feels like to be working, doing this holy spiritual work with masses of people at the same time. I imagine that many of the people who did this saved up their entire lives, dreamt their entire lives, that they would one day have the opportunity to go up to Jerusalem and do this sacred pilgrimage, the sacred walk. Except, the text says, for someone with a broken heart. Misha Erodavar, someone to whom something terrible had happened. That person would go up to Jerusalem, ascend the steps of the Temple Mount, enter through the same arched entryway. But when everyone else turns to the right, that person would turn to the left and would circle around the perimeter of the courtyard in exactly the opposite direction, just like so many of us have experienced in life when you feel like the whole world is moving in one direction, but you, the brokenhearted, are moving in the other direction. And every person who came in to the left would be greeted by someone coming from the right who would stop, who would look into their eyes and simply say, Ma lach, what happened to you? What is your story? Where is your pain? Why does your heart hurt? And this person walking to the left would answer saying, Ani Avela, I am a mourner. My father died just before Rosh Hashanah this year. Or maybe they would say, my partner just left and I'm totally blindsided. I had no idea. Or I'm worried sick about my kid. Or I just feel so alone. And I don't feel like I belong anywhere in this world. And I don't know what to do. I can't shake that feeling. Whatever they would say, the people who are walking from the right would look at them, would hear them, and then would offer them a blessing. May you find comfort as you navigate this path of mourning. May you be held with love, even as you hold your own loved one with your broken heart. May you always find a place where you truly feel that you belong. And that's it. Then they'd keep going. And then they'd have dinner. So, so what I realized, there's always dinner afterwards or at least a snack. So what I realized when I re-encountered this text, having experienced something of life, is that the rabbis had such a profound understanding of the human condition because the rabbis understood that this was a ritual that was created for the people who did not want to be involved in this ritual, the mourner or the brokenhearted or the lonely. The last thing in the world she wants to do is get out of bed, let alone show up in a place where there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people and everyone's doing something and she's doing it differently. And yet she does show up and she's not allowed to pretend that she's like everyone else and turn to the right because she's not okay. And she has to understand that when you're not okay, you have to be honest about how not okay you are and trust that your broken heart will be held with love. And the people who are going this way, who are having the time of their lives, who are singing and moving in sync with each other, the last thing in the world that they want to do is say to the people they're walking with, like, hey, I'll catch you afterwards at the cookies. I'm going to go check on this brokenhearted person who's coming toward me. They do not want to step out of that sacred moment to greet a person that they probably don't even know whose heart is broken. And yet they must. And in fact, Based on this Mishnah, that is the holy work of what we do in the pilgrimage. We go up to the Temple Mount precisely in order to enact this sacred encounter. And I realized at some point that this is actually the very essence of life, that we are called to encounter one another at precisely the moments that we least want to. So now pull back to, you know, 2020s. 2022, 2023, we're living, even in the course of the last couple of years up till today, in the midst of an epidemic of loneliness, a crisis of loneliness, of social alienation, of isolation, of ideological extremism that is pulling us apart. And it is not only breaking our hearts, it's actually breaking our bodies. 
So what we now know is that over the course of the last 20 years, there's been a lot of research done on loneliness. And what it shows is that it doesn't just hurt our hearts, it actually hurts our hearts. In other words, we now know that experiencing acute loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of what it does to our hearts. The Surgeon General of the United States has called this such a profound crisis that he's using the language of epidemic to describe it. He traveled around the world and what he found was that the health crisis that is plaguing Americans is the crisis of loneliness. And it not only hurts our bodies and our spirits, but it actually is endangering our democracy. Because as Hannah Arendt, the great 20th century philosopher writes, isolation and social alienation and loneliness are preconditions for tyranny. Totalitarian regimes cannot take hold. Conspiracy theories cannot take hold in a society in which people know and trust their neighbors. And that should scare us right now because before COVID, I said, look back to 2022, 2021, 2020, before COVID, there was a study that came out that said that 30% of Americans do not know the names of their next door neighbors. That 20% of Americans say that they do not have one single confidant in this world, not one person whom they really trust, who they can go to with their fear, with their worry, with their love, with their dreams. We are a society that is standing at the edge of the abyss right now. And this confluence of crises might leave us feeling powerless. Like, what can we do in the face of another epidemic? We're not even over our first epidemic. And what I want to say to you tonight, and really the essence of this book and what I hope will be the heart of our conversation tonight, is that it's precisely at the moment where we feel most powerless that we have to recognize that even when our instincts are to pull away from each other, our power comes from instead leaning toward each other, especially at the moment that we feel like we want to retreat, we need to retreat because it's too hard to be with one another's pain. That's a, precisely the moment where we need to turn toward one another and to do it with love. So that is the heart of the Amen Effect. The text that uh, that really gave me the title for the book that stands at the heart of the book is um, is the Mourner's Kaddish. And I'll tell you how I came to understand the Mourner's Kaddish. Um, and then Rabbi uh, Shmuley and I will engage in, a, engage in a little bit of conversation. And then I'd love to hear where your hearts are and how you're feeling uh, tonight as you hear this. So um, some years ago, a young, uh, a young guy came into my community, uh, came into my office, and he was broken. His father had just died very suddenly without warning. His father was his best friend. He was completely unmoored, and he desperately was searching for an anchor, for a way of making sense of a world that no longer made sense to him in any way. And somebody suggested that he take a look at the Mourner's Kaddish because Jews have some tools. And he, a secular Jew, um, picked up a book and looked at the Mourner's Kaddish and he made the mistake of reading the English translation of the Mourner's Kaddish. And now he was not only unmoored and uncomfortable and full of grief and anguish, but he was full of rage because he felt betrayed by our Jewish tradition. Because if you look at the English translation of the Mourner's Kaddish, it is words of praise for a God that he didn't believe in, but if he did, he would have been furious with and not in the mood to praise. And so he came to me as a kind of last ditch effort to see if I could help him find some sort of sense that he could make of this prayer or some other spiritual anchor for him. And I was about nine years in the rabbinate at this point. And I 
was such a good student. I gave him every best argument that I could remember from seminary about the meaning of mourner's Kaddish, including the, the, the explanation that for me is the most compelling of explanations, which is the idea that when we are in grief and pain, we are not we, we are not alone. We are remembering that we are connected to generations of Jews before us who have also suffered with their own broken hearts, who have also lost loved ones. This is a very old prayer. Some people say it originates in the Talmud. Others say it originates in the early Middle Ages when it was called the Orphan's Prayer, Kaddish Yatom. So, so what we know is that when we experience loss, it makes us feel alone. And I argued to him that what this prayer was trying to do was place his grief in a context of human loss. And he was deeply unimpressed by me. And he walked out of my office very angry. And I sat with it for six months. I sat with that failure and tried to figure out what did I get wrong? What is this prayer, this mysterious prayer that has survived for for 1, 1,500, maybe 2,000 years. What is it coming to teach us? Now, my husband uh, is a screenwriter, so maybe it shouldn't be so surprising that this ended up being the way that I would read this prayer. But one day when I was sitting in shul on Shabbat morning, I suddenly had a realization that actually what was happening in this prayer is not about the words, it's not about the poetry. It's not even necessarily about the, the the interpretation that I was so moved by. I started to envision Mourner's Kaddish like a screenplay in which a mourner, someone with a broken heart, has the courage to stand up in a room full of people, some who love her and some who don't even know her, and just say, my heart hurts because someone I loved has died. And a community of people who may or may not know that person in anguish says, amen. And then the person goes on to say, I don't even know how to make sense of life right now. I am experiencing a kind of disequilibrium. This is spiritual disorientation. I don't even know which way is up right now. And the community says, amen. And then the person says, I'm so scared. I can't remember things. I feel like I'm losing the sound of his voice. I feel like I'm forgetting. And the community says, amen. And the person goes on and on and expresses the anguish and the fear and the concern and the sadness and the gratitude, all of it. And the community says, amen, the amen, the amen, the amen, relentless love. I don't even know you and I love you. I see you. And your pain, your loss might scare the hell out of me. Because by the way, when I look at you in the fragile state you're in after experiencing this loss, it reminds me of how fragile I am too. And even still, I'm not going to run away from you. I'm right here. Amen. And I realized that, that the Kaddish is actually a contemporary enactment of that ancient ritual of the pilgrimage. It's one of the ways that we differentiate ourselves when our hearts are broken and we trust that we will be held with love and with care by a community of purpose. And that is an incredible offering that we give to one another. Everyone who goes to the right knows that one day they too will go to the left, right? And everybody who goes to the left knows and understands that too. They know that that is part of the part of the arrangement that we make in human community and part of what we do in relationship. And the fact is that whether we like it or not, we are fundamentally relational beings. Biologically, psychologically, and spiritually, we are relational beings. And so that 20% of Americans who don't have anyone in the world that they can talk to or trust, that's terrifying. And our work in this moment, in this moment of compounded crisis, crises, compounding crises, where we have not only the loneliness and the isolation and the social alienation and my grief and Rabbi Shmuley's grief, but we also have this national collective grief and anguish and trauma and fear. Our holiest work is not to retreat from one another, 
but instead to turn toward one another with compassion, with curiosity, and with love. And with that, Rabbi Shmuley, will you join me? Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to being in dialogue with you. And just before that, we said that if you filled out a survey, there would be one winner of one of these amazing books tonight. And we pulled a survey. So our friend Matthew Newman, you were pulled tonight. You get the, the, the winning book, the signed, co the signed copy. Please continue to fill out the survey so we can learn from you about how to improve what we're doing. So Rabbi Browse. Oh, yeah, you're coming up. Good. Okay, you'll, you'll get it signed after. Wonderful. Thank you for filling out the survey. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> so um, community is so hard. It is so hard to be in community. Some people say my community is too politically left. My community is too politically right. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too quiet. It's too loud, right? It's too religiously Hebrew. It's too much English. It's it, uh, but, but my family room. My family room is amazing. Oh, family room is just how I want it. How do we... How <laughs> how how do we cultivate? I don't even know what the adjective is. The, the, the humility, the desire to be in spaces that don't always work for us, mm. because community is so hard to stay in because it doesn't work for us perfectly. Wow! First of all, I love your assumption that everyone's family is working for them. That just sounds great. <laughs> right. I think this group thought that was a joke, but you were serious. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so God God bless us all. We should all have families that work for us and in addition to communities that do. Um, because at some point, I think that we came to understand that all of our relationships, um, our partnerships, our friendships, and our communities should be people who would reinforce our strongest beliefs and not people who would, as uh, we were speaking about earlier, be our as our connecto people who would challenge us and make us think more deeply and make us see the world more deeply while also loving us and not running away from us. So um, so it, it, in the book, one of the chapters is dedicated to loneliness. And I talk about um, a passage from Rambam that I've been interested in for many years now, where Rambam is responding to the text from Pirkei Avod, it says, Aselecha Ravu Kinelecha Kaver. It says, um, make a teacher for yourself and acquire for yourself a friend. And Rambam articulates, it says basically, what's a friend? What does that mean? And articulates that there are three different kinds of friendships that we could be in or relationships that we could find ourselves in. It's very Aristotelian. So, number one, Level one, this is a utilitarian relationship, a functional relationship. You need something from me, I need something from you. And it's not bad to have utilitarian relationships, except we have to know that the minute the utility ceases, the relationship ends. It's bad to marry somebody you have a utilitarian relationship with, but it's not bad to shop from a store where you have a utilitarian relationship with the store owner. Although if you're my grandfather, you don't have a utilitarian relationship with anybody because he literally made it his life's work to make sure that he knew that he knew everybody. I mean, the wait staff, the checkout counter, the, the guy who does the bags, every single person he encountered, he wanted to deeply know. So that would be the second level of relationship, which is a relationship of mutual care and concern where I care about you and you care about me. It's not that we need something from one another. It's that we enjoy life together. We like being around each other. We don't always agree, but we get, we get joy out of being together. And then the highest level of relationship, because of course it is hierarchical for him, the highest level of relationship is relationships of shared purpose. And that's where the two of us together are trying to build something that's bigger than either of us alone. And that is a kind of ideal relationship. And what I argue in the book is that what we strive to do is create communities that stand at the intersection of relationships of mutual care and concern and relationships of shared purpose. Because I realized at some point with Ikar, and I don't know what your all of your experiences are in your many different communities, but we set out to build Ikar in the spring of 2004. And what we really wanted to do was stand at the intersection of a kind of reanimated, revitalized Jewish life. I wanted the Shabbat experience to be so powerful and nourishing and invigorating that we would look forward to Shabbat starting on Tuesday. Like that was my dream, you know? I want like 
hipster 28 year olds walking around going, oh my God, you know, four more days till Shabbos. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we wanted to reanimate, <laughs> we wanted to reanimate Jewish life and we wanted to build a just and loving society, not just for Jews, but for everyone. And so I, I mean, I really, really, we set out from the gates to do these two things and they fueled each other. The depth of our spiritual encounter was only enhanced by the power of our justice commitments, by our work on with, with on, on immigration rights, on criminal justice, on racial justice, on, on climate justice. We were deeply dedicated and we got our fuel on Shabbos and then we go out into the world and do the work. And I realized at some point, right about 10 years in, right about six months after I met this guy and failed him because his father died and I didn't know how to help him find meaning in our traditions, I realized that we who believe that we can help build the beloved community, Dr. King's vision of a world redeemed out in the world, need to start by building the beloved community internally. That, that our work out there in a way means nothing if we don't turn to one another with love. In other words, relationships of shared purpose, like we're activists working on the same campaign together, they don't mean a whole lot if at the end of the day, when one of them has surgery, the other one doesn't call the check-in and see how they're doing. And so I ended up giving this sermon um, on Yom Kippur 11 years ago called the Amen Effect or the Amen Effect, depending on which crowd I'm talking to. Next week, I'm going to be uh, with, with a church and two churches in a synagogue. So I have to figure out if I go with Amen or Amen or Amen. Um, so... <laughs> So I ended up giving a sermon called The Amen Effect in which I talked about this plague of loneliness that was um, that was causing so much pain in our world that I talked about the mourner's cottage. And I talked about a lot of the things that have already come up here tonight. And I essentially said to our community, we have got to figure out how to find our way to each other. And some people had done that naturally, of course, but but some people didn't. They They pulled away and they retreated from the people who didn't see the world exactly as they did even in our own community, they went to their own circles. And, and, and really what I said is like, this is now, this is, a, I'm, not, I'm speaking about this, not just as a nice thing to do, but it's a religious obligation that we actually show up for one another as a religious obligation. And do you know something happened at, after that sermon? The community changed. It changed. Like people started showing up at shivas of strangers. Now, in some spaces, that's not unusual at all. It was certainly unusual in our space. Like that hadn't happened before. People started to, I mean, these meal trains that were like many screens long to bring food to people after their surgeries. And when we dance on Shabbat for a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah or an ufrif before a wedding, People who don't know the kid are up there dancing and lifting the chair and experiencing joy together. And so something like shifted in the consciousness of the community. And I think that shift was, we don't need to only be in these tiny intimate clusters of people who see everything exactly as we do. We have to share some broader vision of what's just and what's right in the world. Then we have to figure out how to love each other. We just have to get close to each other be proximate to each other, understand each other's pain and each other's fear. And once we can see each other in that human way, that actually helps us build a lot of bridges to figure out how to how, how to share a, a vision for the broader world as well. So one of the words that you've been writing about a, a, a lot about and speaking about tonight is care, is care. And I know a lot of people in the world, as do you, and many of them are in this room who care a lot. They care so much. And I also know a lot of people, and I really don't mean this as a critique, who don't really care so much. Mm. Meaning they care about having a good lunch, they care about their bank account, they care about their grandchild. And um, and I, I really don't mean it as a critique because I think they're sad that they don't care. They 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 know how to pretend to care, but to really care about, mm. about the hostages, to really care about global poverty, to really care about going to Shiva when I'd rather go to bed early, right? They don't know how to care. So how, 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 and that's a part of loneliness too. How do you think about those who wish they cared more can to cultivate that care? That's such an interesting question. It makes me think about, I, I was invited to, um, to, to speak to a group of donors um, some years ago, and I had just come from the launch of the Poor People's Campaign that Bishop William Barber, um, this is the, the campaign that 
um, that Dr. King started and that Bishop Barber essentially took on as his life's work. And, and, um, and he, he would say like, I, you know, I've been called to pick up the baton and carry on. And so, um, so Dr. Bar Bar Bishop Barber was talking about how there are 140 million people living in poverty or severely low income in this country. And so I was talking to this small group of, of very, um, of very significant donors and I, I used the word crisis, I guess, one time too many. And finally, one guy said, I hear you saying crisis, Rabbi. I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, apparently there are 140 million Americans who are living in poverty or low income. That seems like a crisis to me. And he said, not to me. He said, I'm doing fine. He said, I have the greatest apartment in New York City. And just take a look at my wife. And he pointed to his very beautiful wife. And I thought, wow, I have a sermon for next Shabbos. <laughs> wow. They don't usually hand it to you like that. You know, like I don't need to do any work. It just works for itself. And so I thought of exactly, exactly the question that you're asking. I will tell you, I, I believe that um, I realized at some point that I really spent the first um, more than decade thinking that the great spiritual challenge of being a rabbi in this time was that our people were too comfortable and that we needed to afflict the comfortable, that our job really was to stir people up and say, I know that you're okay right now. Thank God you're okay. We're not okay, right? The world is not okay. That whole idea of Ubuntu, like when you ask somebody in South Africa, you know, how, how are you? And they'll say, we are not well, or we are well, this kind of collective we. I felt like I spent years trying to say, we are part of a collective that is aching right now, and we need to do something about it. And then at some point it shifted, and we realized how profoundly unwell we were, and we became consumed by how unwell we were. We were so afflicted. And then I felt like my job was to comfort the afflicted, right? Not to afflict the comfortable all the time. And actually, in fact, you know, both of those um, are, are really the work of a, of a pastor or a rabbi. Our work is to do both and to gauge the moment and to gauge, see where the hearts are and what people actually need. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, it, I think that there are, there certainly are people um, who just feel because of the isolation from the suffering, uh, the the emotional, the emotional distance from some of the suffering that's going on in the world, they feel that they're just okay. When I have to tell you, we all breathe the same air, we all drink the same water, we are not okay. And so, I, and and I also will say, I think that most people actually understand that right now. I think that the level of anxiety, concern, anguish, trauma, and fear that many, many people are experiencing on the daily, not only in our Jewish community, but beyond is palpable right now. And so our job is to figure out how with love can we start to mend some of what's broken here. Um, I will share with you that on the cover of the book, um, I, you know, I use this, this ritual of the Temple Mount um, in every chapter. My um, my goal was to really explore deeply what it all the different aspects of this question. Like, for example, what happens to the people who either by profession or by character are always walking to the right? They train their eyes to see who's anguished here, who's broken here, who can I help, who can I lift up? So where does all that grief go? And we can talk about that a little bit. And I'm curious your take on that too. So that's one of the chapters. I mean, every chapter is looking at this, at this mission, at this mission and different angles of this ritual through a lot of storytelling. Um, but when it came time to design the cover of the book, I realized that I didn't want to have a circle on the cover because there's so many great books with circles on the covers already. And uh, one of my dear friends and congregants, uh, Lawrence Azarad, is an incredible um, designer and his mother died. And we spoke um, about a week after when he finished Shiva. And he said, by the way, what are you thinking about for the cover? And I said, and, and, we, and I said to him, you know what? Did you do Kriya when your mother died? We did, you did. We did, we talked about Kriya. Kriya, the ritual of tearing a garment 
um, to externalize the anguish that we're feeling in our heart. And we talked about how powerful that ritual was for him. And I said, I don't know if I ever told you this, but there's an incredible halacha, there's an incredible Jewish law that says you wear your kriya for, for all of Shiva. You wear your torn garment um, for all of Shiva. And, but then at the end of the 30 days, you're actually allowed to sew it back together because the rabbis were practical people and they understood that not everybody had many, many different shirts or dresses or suits, whatever. And so they said that you could sew it back together, but only with rough stitches of a, maybe a different thread so that anyone who gets close to you will say, that's a person who's been all torn up, but now is healing. And then when your time of grieving is over, you can actually sew it with a fine thread, but when you lose a parent, you can never sew it back up all the way with a fine thread because it's always there. And now it's like scar tissue. It's just your heart is always different after, after that kind of loss. And as Lawrence and I were talking about this idea, I realized that that was the visual image for the cover of the book. Like we are all torn up as individuals and as communities and as a society, but we can mend. It just, it takes a lot of work to sew something back together that's really been torn apart. And when it's sewn together, you can see on the cover, it's a thread of a different color because it's gonna be different what we rebuild here. It's gonna be different than it, than it was before. And in some ways it's gonna be stronger like scar tissue is because we've been through so much anguish together that on the other side, we'll be able to see how it has strengthened our spirits. That reminds me of something that my teacher, Rabbi Weiss, said to me when my mother passed away six months ago. He said, losing someone you love that closely, it's like a light goes off in your house and the light never turns back on, mm -hmm. but you learn how to navigate and get around the house. And I think about that because um, sometimes we're waiting for that light to come back, back on, but it can't come back on. But we, but we learn how to navigate the world. And um, so, you know, to move to something that's always on our minds these days, uh, post October 7th, I think uh, there's many stories of, of allies that have emerged to Jews that are inspiring of how they stand with us, um, with, the, with all the anti-Israel sentiment, anti-Semitism rising. And there's many other concerning stories of kind of uh, abandonment um, of Jews. And in terms of, as somebody who both builds Jewish community and works towards a better society at large, how how do you think about um, caring for people at a time that it's not clear they care about us? Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, in the eighth chapter, the first seven chapters, of the, as I said, are all sort of exploring the way this mission works when the person who's coming to the left is the brokenhearted. But I don't want to give the whole book away, but I reveal in chapter eight that actually there are two... Uh, characters that are mentioned. There are two examples of people who are mentioned as those who could turn to the left when they enter the space. And one is the mourner from which I extrapolate the brokenhearted. And the second is a category called the menudeh. And the menudeh is uh, somebody who has been put into nidui. They have been punished. It is a very rare and severe form of punishment in the ancient world that was only given to someone who caused grave harm. It's like one step short of excommunication. Someone who is a, a menuda does not count in a minion. We don't invite them over for Shabbos dinner. We're supposed to socially distance from them. They're supposed to stand six feet away from us. But the Mishnah says that they too would go up to the Temple Mount. They're not allowed in your restaurant, but they went up to the Temple Mount. And they would enter through the same entryway and they would turn to the left like the brokenhearted. And they, the ostracized, we translate Menudeh as ostracized, they would circle in the direction of the brokenhearted. And even though under any other circumstance, you're not supposed to talk to a Menudeh, someone who's coming from this direction stops, looks in their eyes and asks them, what happened to you? What, what does the world look like from your perspective? What is your, what's going on in your heart? And the person says, I have been ostracized. And we have to imagine that they had a perfect criminal justice system and nobody was ever ostracized who didn't deserve it, okay? <laughs> because otherwise this doesn't work. Spinoza, Spinoza didn't deserve yeah. it. Otherwise it's, le it's less remarkable, okay? 
So, so the person says, I've been ostracized. And the person who's going this way says, God, this guy must have done something truly terrible. Or I know this guy and I'm the one that was hurt by him. And so what do they do? They look into his eyes and they bless him too. And the rabbis argue about what's the blessing that they give. And one rabbi says, oh, you should bless him. Maybe one day, may you one day be embraced by your community again. And the other says, no, no, no. You bless him saying, may you realize how you screwed up and fix yourself so that you can be embraced by community again. But it doesn't matter. What matters is they bless him, right? And and so I'm just like, uh, so so I want to I want to say a couple of different things to answer your question. One is that we are being called to consider not only how to open our hearts to the people who are coming toward us who are brokenhearted, but maybe even to the people who are coming at us. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're coming at us. We're going this way. They're going this way. And it hurts because the, the men who did, did something that hurt us. And, and, and now we encounter this person and the text is saying, see his humanity. It doesn't justify his behavior. It does not relieve him of his punishment, but see that he too is a person and that you don't know what the world looks like from his vantage point. You can only ask. So get curious about him and ask. Answer number two is what happened. I know that's hard. I know, cur okay, before I go to answer number two, I see a couple of people shaking their heads. So I'm gonna address that. I understand on a, from a psychological perspective that it is extremely difficult and for some people impossible to get curious when you do not have social safety. I understand that fear and anguish and trauma, which most people in the Jewish world have right now, make it extremely difficult to get curious about people we think are coming at us, okay? This is not written down and preserved for 2000 years because it's easy and because it's what we would instinctively do. The reason that our sacred texts tell us to do things is because we wouldn't do them were we not told to, because it's counter instinctual. So not everybody is able to do this or ready to do this. And I've been thinking over the last um, six weeks since I started going on the book, you know, talking about the book in various places, I've been thinking that when you're in Shiva, when you are in the house of mourning in your most intense period of grief, you do not build bridges. You stay home and you weep and you are surrounded by love. The only people you encounter are not your colleagues and your classmates. You stay home and people who love you come into your home and feed you. They feed your body and they feed your spirit and help you grieve. And I believe that our Jewish community is in a kind of collective extended Shiva right now. And it feels really right to be surrounded by love when we're in Shiva. And I will also tell you that we can't stay in Shiva forever. And there's a moment for a mourner when we get up from Shiva and we actually walk around the block. And that's another circle. And when we walk around the block, has, have any of you ever done this ritual? When we walk around the block, you start to realize that there's a whole world out there that you haven't been paying attention to for the last week because you've rightfully been focused on your broken heart. And what you see is you see your neighbor who lost their dog, right? Because the dog ran away. And then you see your other neighbor who just lost their parent. And then you see your other neighbor who's just late for work. And suddenly you're, the scope of your moral concern has extended out beyond your own grief. And it doesn't mean that you're no longer grieving because your loved one died just a week ago, but it means you now realize that the world is bigger than it was. That's when you start to build bridges. And I think that some people in our Jewish community now are, are still deep in Shiva in this kind of suspended reality. I, I mean, and until every single hostage comes home, I think that many of us will be in that position, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally. And there are others who feel like we're ready to walk around the block and to start to encounter our neighbors and start to have hard conversations with some of the folks that maybe we were expecting that when we were walking to the left, they didn't appear from the right to hold us. And, and, and maybe we feel like, okay, I think it's time for me to go have coffee with that person and say, I was really hurt that you abandoned me. It's not for everybody all the time, 
but it might be for some people in this room. It might be that that time is right. I know that many of us felt, this was my second answer, that as we walked to the left, that we were not met with the kind of love and care that we deserved and that we needed. And here, I will just tell you that when that happens, it happened to me too. It was devastating. I dedicated my life to this space, to these movement spaces. It's been very hard. And in chapter one of my book, I start to I share with you the story of one particular catastrophic loss that happened in our community to a beloved family. And um, they were they were out with their kids driving to uh, a, a short weekend away in the desert, and they were hit by a drunk driver who was driving over 90 miles an hour, who was drunk and high and had no highlights, no lights on. And both of their children died and the parents survived. And these kids were beloved in our community. They both became an image buddy car. Um, the parents were beloved. This is like an unthinkable trauma. And we navigated the trauma as a community and I speak about them in the book and, and you should really want the father, Colin, um, he wrote a beautiful book about grief called Finding the Words, which I hope you'll read. Um, it's, it's gorgeous. And he wrote about how as a non-Jew married to a Jewish woman with Jewish kids, Jewish mourning ritual helped him survive the loss of his children. And it's a really powerful explanation of mourning rituals um, and grief and love and loss. But at the end of the chapter, I share that six months after this most horrific loss, we had another tragedy in the community and another young person died and totally freak accident. And so I realized that I had to call this family. To, I had to call Gail and Colin to tell them because I didn't want them to find out from the community email. And so I called them and they were silent for a moment. And then they said, please tell the parents that when they're ready, they should call us, maybe we can help. And I share that now because I think that many of us feel like we've been walking to the left and nobody's coming from the right. Nobody's here to hold us and help us, even though just a few minutes before actually in dinner, a few people mentioned, actually you have had a bunch of non-Jewish friends who've been really wonderful. And, and, thank, and I thank you for lifting that up to the folks who did. Um, but even when we don't have anyone coming from the right, we have others coming from the left and we can support each other because Gail and Colin were nowhere near ready to start to turn to the right. And they were already able to start to take care of others who were heartbroken too. And I think that many of us know that there is this kind of fellowship of suffering that in some ways we were just talking about this, that when we're grieving, we feel an even deeper connection to other people who are grieving. And, and there's this little circle of, um, of women at Icar who've had breast cancer. And when someone's diagnosed with breast cancer, immediately they go to them and they say, okay, here we are, we're your, we're your new sisterhood. And there is this kind of sisterhood of suffering, fellowship of suffering. And I feel like that's my second answer to you, which is even if we feel we haven't been held with love by the rest of the world, who we imagine we would have wanted to have held us, that's when we hold each other. And we hold each other until we're able to move to the next phase in our grieving. Um, just one more question for me, then we're going to open it up. Um, so I think there's there's two types of loss here. One type of loss is this human type of loss we're talking about. Illness, death, a sense that's so um, easy for us to understand each other. But there's another type of loss that's a little more complicated. It's an ideological loss where we might disagree with what someone else feels they've lost. Mm. And I wonder when or how do we say amen um, in those cases? And let me give two complicated examples, although I don't wanna get hung up in the examples, so I'm hesitant to do it. But um, one might be um, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Someone says, your 1948 celebration is my Nakba, right? Everything about what you celebrate, I mourn. Mm. This, is this is just pure loss, mm. right? It's a totally different narrative from the Zionist, well, there are very different elements from the typical Zionist narrative. Mm. Another example, I'm a, I'm a MAGA supporter, right? I feel great loss for, we've lost America. There was a white America, there was a straight America, there was a more traditional America. There was something really great here. And I'm mourning and I'm angry that we've lost that America. 
And I'm saying, oh, I kind of like the progress. I kind of like the more women's rights or the gay rights. I, I like the new the, the progress. I don't see your loss. Mm. Like, what do we do when we're, we're standing in a very different ideological spot from someone else's narrative, but we see that they really experience loss in an authentic way. We just disagree. Do we say amen? Oh, wow. Okay, so um, I just want to be clear that I don't think you were representing your own views when you said, I feel, okay, good. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so I talk about this in chapter eight, I talk about this, you know, this idea of the, the, this is the men of dad chapter. This is the one who's coming at us from a different direction. And I share a bunch of stories there that try to, that attempt to address this. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to just share one, one of them with you now, because I think it'll help answer this question. So I'm trying to figure which one's the best one to tell you. I, I know what I'll tell you. Okay. So, um, so Hannah is a member of my, co my community. She's amazing. She grew up Orthodox. Uh, her family's in Jerusalem. She's gay. She's married to, um, to a woman named Kathleen. They got on a plane and went over to Jerusalem for her niece's bat mitzvah. They got there a couple of days early, and so they were excited that they could join the Jerusalem Pride Parade because it's a very special Pride Parade. They went to the parade. They were marching when a Jewish religious extremist who had just been released from prison that morning after serving for 10 years because he tried to murder somebody at the last Pride Parade he was at, took out a knife and stabbed a 16-year-old girl in the back. The girl, Shira Banki, was between life and death. Ha uh, Hannah and Kathleen were 10 feet away when this happened. They witnessed this attempted murder. It, it Unfortunately, Shira died from her wounds a few days later, but they didn't know if she would live or die. She was an ally, an LGBTQ ally. Hannah is devastated. She goes Friday night to the Shabbos dinner for her um, for her family, the bat mitzvah girl and the family. And seated right across the table from her is someone she knew from her childhood, who was a nice guy as a child, but has become radicalized. He now is more affronted by the fact of the pride parade happening in Jerusalem, the desecration of the holy city, than he is by the attempted murder at that pride parade. He has a rap sheet for acts of vandalism against Palestinians, against lefty Jews. He's proud of it. He's not hiding it. And she's thinking, how can I even stay in this room with this person? We see the world in such dramatically and fundamentally different ways. She contemplates getting up, but she doesn't want to be rude to her family. So she's burning up. She has this fever in her. And at some point while she's sitting at that table, she starts to move from rage to curiosity, but it's a fierce curiosity. She's like, what happened to this guy? He was a lovely kid. How did he become so radicalized that he could dehumanize me and others like this? How could that be? Who is he? Does he really believe this stuff? Is he drunk? Like what's happening? So, uh, so she stays at the table. And at some point, at the end of the night, she stands up and she clinks her glass and she goes to give a toast. She doesn't say a word to the guy. And she goes to give a toast to her niece. And she says, listen to me. You are living in a country and in a time where it matters that you lift up human dignity, the dignity of every single person around you. Our Torah demands no less of us. And you have a voice and I am begging you to use your voice to fight for a more just and loving society. Amen. She sat down. The weekend ended. And just a, literally within a week, this guy, who I call Asher in the book, but that's not his real name, Asher calls Hannah's family. And he is upside down. Why? He just spent Shabbat with a lesbian. And he was fine. <laughs> And she seemed nice and he can't understand it. And he says, he keeps asking himself, would I have wanted harm to come to this lovely person who I've known my whole life? And he said, no, I wouldn't want anyone to hurt her. But now he doesn't know how to make, how to make sense of his life because he's in a social environment where everybody knows what's right and what's wrong. And she, she Hannah is wrong, but now he knows that that's not exactly right. Two years later, that guy's at the Pride Parade wearing a rainbow kippah. 
literally, she, Hannah says to me, what I achieved was staying curious enough to stay at the table and not walk out of the room. She did not say a word to this guy. She just wondered about him. And that wonder was enough to actually change this guy's life. I closed the manuscript. She's the last story in chapter eight, at the end of the book. I closed the manuscript. Hannah calls me up in June, July, whenever the Pride Parade was. She says, open the news, open your computer. She's like, look who's on the front page of the Jerusalem Post today. This guy with his rainbow kippah, it's been like years now, like five, six, seven years. I don't know how many years it was. He's got one kid on his shoulders who's holding the trans flag. He's got one kid who's in a stroller holding a love wins flag. Like he's totally been transformed. And he's become like a truly decent person in the world who really like really wants the world to be more loving and inclusive and just, and that's just who he is. And she did that by staying at the table. So my answer to you is like, we don't have to say amen to other people's bigotry and to other people's ideas that might, that might, that would cause us harm. We just have to be curious about them. And just as Hannah changed him, we can also be changed when we hold curiosity about people, when we wonder, how is it you seem like such a decent person, but you're holding a view or holding a flag or wearing a button that really hurts my heart? Let's talk about that. What does that phrase mean to you? What does that button mean to you? Let's talk about it. And I do, I know it's really hard to do when our hearts are broken, but I do believe that this is the only way that we begin to mend what's broken in our society. Beautiful. Wow. Okay, friends, um, we're going to open up. Uh, so we just want to, if you better have questions than statements, if possible, and um, <laughs> to try to keep them brief and and hopefully ones that bring a little more light than heat, although heat's, heat's okay too, but okay. Hi, Barry. Barry asked, um, I'm speaking a lot about compassion and curiosity, but what about revenge? A lot of us want revenge. And I would say to you that that there's a reason why families of victims of murder are not the ones who determine what the sentencing should be for the murderer. Because when our hearts are broken, we don't make the best decisions. And I don't see revenge as a Jewish value. And I know that it's a very human instinct and that's why I think we have Torah to help us curb that instinct and instead to live our better selves. I don't think revenge serves us or serves the cause of a just future for anyone. So it might feel good to yearn for revenge. Revenge is incredibly dangerous and only leads to more bloodshed. And I don't think eternal war is the answer. Andy points out that there are still many hostages um, and and families that are desperate um, to be reunited with their loved ones. Um, and at the same time, there are people who are ministers in the Knesset, like Smotrich, for example, who say that the hostages are not a priority right now. Defeating Hamas is a priority. Um, I will say that the word Israel does not appear in the index of my book. <laughs> Um, it's not an Israel book. It's a book about love and loss and community and healing, but I am a rabbi and I do talk and care a lot about this right now. Um, so what we've seen over the course of the last four months is that the country is divided um, between people who see different priorities of this war as the preeminent uh, priority. So from the beginning, from the outset, the war was justified uh, by the government on the grounds that they needed to get the hostages back and defeat Hamas. And many people in the country feel like getting the hostages back is the most important thing. And others in the country feel that defeating Hamas is the most important thing so there won't be future hostages, et cetera. Um, it's very painful. It's very painful to see this division um, in the community. And it's even, there's even a painful division in the hostage family community because there are some hostage families who are holding signs that say all for all. And that's been, I was there two weeks after the atrocities and I went to Hostage Square in Tel Aviv and 
I saw these signs and I asked, what does that mean all for all? Do you know what, do you know what that means? Literally give back every single Palestinian prisoner. It doesn't matter what they did to get our people home right now. All for all. I just want my baby home, right? And then there are people who are literally blocking aid to going into Gaza to help make sure that there is not a catastrophic famine in which hundreds of thousands of people, God forbid, will die because there's no food and medicine. Because they say, why should you get any food or medicine when my kid is not home yet? So there is a different, there's, there are different ways of holding this moment. And, um, and I think that this is part of what Rabbi uh, Shmuley was talking about. It feels like we are being driven to the breaking point right now. In fact, having to decide between those two and which one is a greater priority is a really unfair thing for anyone to be put to, to be to be forced to, to um forced to decide. But I will tell you that I take my spiritual cues from hostage parents like Hirsch's parents, Hirsch Goldberg Polin. And many of you have heard Rachel Goldberg's voice over the course of the past several months. And what I hear from her as a mother is an aching desperation to get her child back. And somehow in the midst of that aching desperation, she's even able to imagine a future, if you read her poem, in which she and a Palestinian mother are laughing together and drinking tea and watching their children play with their children in a just and peaceful future. And so I will choose every single time to cast my lot on that side of history rather than on the side of the people who are blocking the trucks of humanitarian aid and ministers like Ben Gvir and Smotrich, whose ideas are anathema to my understanding from our Jewish history and our Torah of who we are called to be. I think by talking about it, we revive the interest in it. I think that's the thing. I mean, we we talk about how meaningful it is for me. I, I, I'm so grateful that I got to have seven nights. Um, it's also exhausting. And, you know, for people who who do this, like at some point you're like, I just want a little bit of privacy and I just like to have my, but, um, but it was incredibly meaningful for me to have uh, to have the seven nights. And I think by talking about it, we we share with others that that really the Jewish morning rituals are one of the things that we do best as Jews. This is an incredibly sophisticated um, awareness of the human psyche and the human condition that went into crafting these rituals. And for me personally, they've been um, incredibly meaningful. And I know for others as well. Thank you. That's that's a really that's a really good question. Um, look, one of the reasons that we're so lonely right now is clearly because of technology. Um, and I, and I say this knowing that during COVID technology literally saved our lives. Like we, I mean, seeing others and to our friends who are here on zoom, um, a special, uh, just some special love for you that, that for those who can't be in person, the technology can absolutely help us connect with loved ones and feel a sense of being held. And also you've all seen this when you go to a restaurant and every person in the family is on their own phone. Right. Like it's family dinner, but they're all on their own phone or there's they're on a date, but they're both talking to other people on their phone. And sometimes I say, kids, it's movie night. We're watching Dirty Dancing again. And they all come down the hall and my kids are watching the movie, but also double devicing and they're on their own phones. Like what's actually happening with technology is it is distancing us from each other. And I think it is compounding a sense of loneliness. That's not even talking about what happens to, for example, a teenager when you look at your reel and you see that all your friends are someplace and you're not there. And, and then you feel even more alone. And so I think that the technology is absolutely a part of what's, uh, of what's making us feel lonely right now. How do we take a first step? Thank you for asking that service is how you take your first step, service, like volunteer, come to the synagogue and say, hey, I have a few hours on my hands, what can I do to help you, right? I literally, I will never forget this, I was, years ago was doing a scholar residence in Texas, in Plano, Texas, and, um, and there was this there was this young woman um, who was involved. Everyone in, in the place was like, uh, was over 70, but then there was like this 24 year old woman. And I said to her, well, how'd you get involved? And she said, well, I came once to shul, um, and I asked if I could help. And they asked me if I would fold the um, this the handouts that people get. 
And she said, I folded them so carefully, she said, <laughs> and so perfectly. She said, I couldn't, I felt so honored that I could help in some way. And I just decided I like that feeling. And so I started to come back. So I want to say service is the most powerful way because it not only brings you into relationship with other humans, but it also, it, rem it reminds you that you have a purpose in the world right? It, it helps remind you that there's a way that you can have a positive impact on someone else. And, and may, you know, maybe we, we come to a close with something that we started with, which is Beth in the pottery studio, right? Like just realizing that she could say to someone, do you want to talk about that? Actually changed her experience of the day. And so I, I do feel, it doesn't have to be volunteering in a formal way, in a formal institution. It could literally be you know, calling up a friend who you know is going through a difficult time. And, and let me just say, in the, like in the spirit of, of speaking about the Torah of showing up, um, that, that um, tomorrow is the yard site of a beloved um, person in my community who was a young man named Jordan, who was a healer. Um, and he was an incredibly gentle soul and a beautiful soul. And he died by suicide six years ago. And um, his mother is very, very dear to me. And she's been navigating this nightmare for the last six years. And I just found out a couple of years ago that on the he died on Friday. The Friday after his death, she got a call from someone in our community who she didn't really know very well. They had like sat on one committee together once. And they said, hey, we know that you found your son's body on a Friday. And so we figured Friday would be a hard day for you. So we just wanted to say, we love you. And then they called the next Friday and then they called the next Friday. And I found out a couple of years ago that they had been calling her every single Friday for three and a half years at that time. And now every Friday for six years, they literally, sometimes it's 30 seconds on the phone. Sometimes it's two hours. They've become the dearest of friends. And she said they were right. Fridays are really horrible for me, but I always now look forward to having this connection with someone. That's service, right? So, so find a way to connect with another person, someone in need, who you can just bring a little bit of joy to and a little bit of light to. That is, I think, the best path out of, of loneliness. Are you signaling that we're done? Because I want to ask well, one more thing. Can you the last two questions together. And okay. Okay, thanks. It sounds like we should have lunch first of all. So let's do that because that, this that will be not a not a closing um, comment on one foot, but a lot much longer conversation. Um, well, let me just start with ritual very quickly. I realize we didn't say really very much at all about joy, so I want to say a word about joy, and then I want to ask you to engage uh, with me in a ritual um, very quickly at the end. Um, I, you know, there are so many, so thank you for that beautiful question. But one that I love so much is um, is Korim, is, is prostrating during Aleinu um, and Musaf on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, only twice a year, right? The whole year when we come to this point in Aleinu, we just bow at the knees, we bow at the waist. But on High Holy Days, we go flat on the ground. And it's so powerful. And in some synagogues, nobody does it. And in some synagogues, the rabbi and the cantor do it. And in a few places, everybody does it. So at Ikar, basically, I said to my community, our first High Holy Days together, you know, you're here for a reason. Let's just experiment. Let's just try and, and see if something happens to your heart. And literally the first year we had 420 people at High Holy Days. We just started in July and this was like High Holy Days. And I told people to step out of their rows and get to find a patch of floor and every single person in that room, the cynics I'm talking about, right? The Republicans, they were on the ground, on the, right? My dad was, he went, he went and he prostrated fully on the ground and all you could hear in that room were people crying. And then I, and I really like, there's so much power. Why are we having the rabbi do it for us? Prayer by proxy, like the rabbi will have a meaningful experience, but won't because everybody's watching her. So why don't we all engage in this experience together? Our This tradition is ours. This is our sacred inheritance. And then I realized that as powerful and as important as it is to prostrate fully to the ground and one, one time a year, High Holy Days, to say, I'm trying hard to control the world, but I get it. I can't control all the forces. 
I can't make terrible things not happen. I can't make cancer not happen. I can't make drunk drivers not go down that road. Terrible things. I'm just, I need help. I need to be held by love, by a force greater than me. And maybe it's God and maybe it's community and maybe it's love. I don't know, but I can't do it on my own. And as hard as it is to say that, it's even harder to then stand up. And so after a few years of feeling really proud of myself that I got the whole community to go down on the ground, then I realized now we have to figure out how to stand up. And there are literally people in this room who cannot stand up without the support of somebody near them. So every one of us, when we get up, we rise with someone else. We pull each other up from the ground. And then when we get up, this is not ancient, this is new. <laughs> this, is, this is like 17 years old. We stand in the victory pose because, because we are embodying the fact that while we cannot control everything, there are some things we can do in this world. We can turn to each other with love. We can call a congregant every single Friday if we want to. We can show up and fold study sheets at the entrance to the place. We can bring a lasagna. We can go out to lunch. We can share some of our heart with somebody who needs a connect. There's so much that we can do and we wanna feel our full power even as we hold awareness of what we can't change in the world. So given all of this, um, I I wanna ask, I, I said before that my, my father died um, before High Holy Days this year and I know that Rabbi Shmuley also lost his mother a month before that and I'm certain that we're not the only mourners in this room. And so I would love to ask if we could say Mourner's Kaddish before we break today. Um, and the way that I want to do this, first of all, maybe there's a C-door here that someone can, can can bring me. I figured it was probably. Oh, oh. you don't worry about that. Okay. Got it. Um, here. Got it. Okay. Let, do you know this? No, you don't. Okay. So, um, so what I want to ask is, I want to ask if there's anyone else in this room who's a mourner right now. Someone who's grieving the death of a loved one. Um, maybe you're observing a yard site, the anniversary of a loss. If you are, will you just stand? In some communities, it's customary for everyone to rise for Mourner's Kaddish, but I'm just going to ask that we not and that the people who are standing stand because this is part of the way that we're reenacting this temple ritual also. Because I think it's important to see who's not okay. Because we might not otherwise know. Um, we don't always know. And and wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if in our society there was a way to signal to people like, I really need a little extra love right now. So when we go out for the cookies afterwards, I told you there are always cookies afterwards. There are always cookies. Um, we have cookies? So there, there's always, a, like, didn't you say earlier that <laughs> there's a little, a dessert? Okay, there's something, there's something. Um, that these are the people to, these are the people to give a little extra love to. Um, and maybe say, who are you saying Kaddish for? And tell me a little bit about your mother. That would be a really beautiful gift. And the more immediate gift that we can give is just to say amen, just to be witness to, to the brokenheartedness and just say, I see you and I'm not running away from you. So um, I'll invite you to, to join me. We're on page 294 if you have a book. Yikadal bi kadash shemei rabba. Bialma divra chirute biamlich machute. Behaihon, Viomehon, Vhaye de Hol Bait Israel, Bagala Uvisman Kariv, Bimru, Amen. Yehe Shme Rabba Mevorah, Leolamo Meomaya, Yibarah, Vishabach, Vit Paar, Vit Romam, Vit Nasa, Vitadar, Vitala, Vitala, Shme de Kucha, Brihu, Leela, Nicole, Birhata, Vishirata, Tush Behata, Venehemata, the Amiran Bahama, Bimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya, Vechayim Aleinu, Vakol Yisrael, Vimru Amen. O say Shalom Vimramav, Hu Ya Ase Shalom Aleinu, Vakol Yisrael, Vimru Amen. I want to point out for those of you who aren't looking in the book, but I think you may have noticed this before at some point. The first Amen doesn't really appear in the Sidur, Yikadav Yikadash Me Rabba. Amen. It's not even part of the formal liturgy, but we know that we have to interrupt. It's literally, it's also not the end of a sentence. We interrupt the mourner to say, just so you know, we're right here. We're right here and we're not going anywhere. Um, and so I bless all of you that you know and trust um, that your broken hearts will be held with love and tenderness 
Um, and thank you for holding mine today.